Hello everybody and welcome to this panel session for the Invisible Queer. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on in this area where I am. It's the Yagara and Turrbal people and I'd like to pay my deepest respects to elders past and present. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge that because this is a virtual session we are zooming onto the lands of many many different Aboriginal people across Australia and I'd like to acknowledge the elders um, of the places that you're zooming in from this always was always will be aboriginal land and sovereignty was never ceded so bisexuality the b has been a part of the rainbow flag since 1978 and yet despite its solid historical place in queerdom bisexuals are often the invisible sexuality overlooked underrepresented and often forced into an endless cycle of coming out as their sexual identity is often wrongly assumed to be in relation to whoever they happen to be sleeping with at the time as a result bisexuals uh, can feel like outliers, they feel ostracised sometimes, and um, sometimes that's both from heterosexual and homosexual communities. And they're more susceptible in general, according to statistics, to mental health issues with much higher rates of suicide and self-harm than most other corners of the queer community. I am Chrissy Neem, bisexual author and uh, the author of eight full length works of fiction, poetry and nonfiction. And my latest book is the memoir, The Three Burials of Lottie Neem. With me today, I have three bisexual writers who are keen to discuss how their sexual identities affect their own work and their lives and how we can do better as a literary community to reflect the lives of bisexual folk in our work. Angela Meyer is an award-winning writer and editor. She is queer, bisexual. Her debut novel, A Superior Spectre, was shortlisted for many awards, including an Aurealis Award and a Saltire Literary Society Award in Scotland. She is also the author of a novella, Joan Smokes, which won the inaugural Ms. Lexia novel, Novella Award in the UK, and a book of flash fiction called Captives. Her work has been widely published in magazines, journals and newspapers. She has worked in bookstores, as a book reviewer and in a whiskey bar and as a commissioning editor and publisher. She now works as a freelance editor and consultant and she grew up in northern New South Wales and lives in Melbourne. Welcome, Angela. Thank you so much, Chrissy. Coming in from Boonwurrung, Boonwurrung and Woiwurrung land uh, here near Melbourne. Thank you. Great. We also have with us Anna Kochakova, who is Russian-born Australian author and poet, social media strategist for not-for-profits all around the country, and a passionate BiPlus activist based in Sydney. Anna is the author of the Bi and Prejudice book, which is one person's story attempting to connect the dots of identity and sexuality across continents and cultures, and the creator of Bi and Prejudice Instagram community which helps celebrate multi-sexual attraction and human diversity. Welcome, Anna. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to join today. And I'm coming from the land of the Gadigal people of the Euro Nation. Great, thanks, Anna. And finally, we have Emily James, who is a film production and creative writing student at UTS, who loves story above all all things, unless there's a chocolate around, apparently. Uh, she is passionate about queer stories and is particularly interested in the experiences of queer women, bisexual people and older queer people. Emily has had the opportunity to interview Peter DeWall, a pioneer for gay rights in Australia, and her story Farewell to the Witches features in Spineless Wonders anthology Queer as Fiction. She has previously worked with the Microflix Festival and awards as a festival organiser, Spine Out, Good Reading Magazine as a reviewer. Welcome to you, Emily. Thank you so much. So yeah, I'm zooming in from um, Green Guy and uh, Derek Land. It's really nice to be here. Well, welcome everybody for this session on The Invisible Queer. And I'm going to start by um, the terminology that we're using, because um, we've been using the word bisexual. Um, and uh, of course, there are a myriad of words that we can use to um, talk about people who are attracted to um, a multiple of sexuality. And I just wanted to kind of ask you if bisexual is your most comfortable word and how important language is in this context. So maybe I might start with you. 
Sorry, was that me? <laughs> oh, no, no, sorry, Anna. Was, are you uh, hearing me? Sorry. Yeah, I'm hearing you now. The, sorry, um, I dropped out for one moment. The term bisexual, um, is that the term that you're most comfortable with or are there other terms that you prefer to use? Thank you for asking that. It's such a good place, I think, to even start talking about bisexuality or, or trying to converse in this space because it does feel invisible a lot of the times and bisexuality or bisexual person definitely is my term at the moment. And I actually really love it because I feel that bisexuality is having a bit of a bad PR situation. So I feel like Maybe there is an opportunity to have more conversations around bisexuality by even just having the term. So thank you for asking that is definitely today. Is that the same for you, Angela? Do you feel similar? Yeah, absolutely. For me, it was the first uh, term that I came across that described um, who I was and how I feel. So it's the one I've sort of um, stuck to. Um, I, I did flirt with using pansexual for a little while um, because uh, because of the way I invoked a binary and I knew I was attracted to all genders, but then I realized that you can use the term bisexual as a kind of um, screw you to the binary. And, you know, um, so I, I went back to using that term. And I also agree with Anna that even you know, I'm sure we'll get to this, but um, on TV and things like that, the word bisexual is, is rarely ever used, even with characters who have multi-gender attraction. So um, I, I like also using it in that way and sort of owning it. And Emily, how do you feel about the term? Yeah, definitely. I definitely agree with what everyone has said in that no one seems to like to say it. It's this awkward, oh, they're a free spirit there you know this or that whereas yeah despite the fact that the word has existed for decades and there's so much wonderful history around it in australia and you know outside of australia yeah it just seems to be something that people are so scared by so i do try to yeah definitely use it and embrace using it because i think that otherwise i feel like in a way i'm almost contributing to that sort of invisibility or not wanting to be visible. So I do have to find my, I do find myself almost subconsciously doing that sometimes. So I do find that I like to make an active effort to be like, yes, bisexual colors, everything, all of those things. Yeah. To make it something that is part of my identity and that people know is part of my identity. Thank you. I, I think um, growing up, I was very, um, I found it really hard to kind of see um, writers using bisexuality or um, having bisexual characters. Um, and I wondered if the three of you had had any experience when you were younger of having bisexual characters or bisexual writers influence your um, identities when you were younger. So I might start with you, Angela. How did, how was it for you as a young person and what, where did you see yourself? Yeah, it, it definitely wasn't in literature, actually, um, when, you know, I was, it was sort of adolescence that I really um, discovered that I had multi-gender attraction and uh, I didn't really know anybody around me who'd expressed those sorts of thoughts or feelings. I grew up in regional Australia um, and uh, the first time I came across the term was an interview with Angelina Jolie in a magazine. And she, she used the term bisexual, um, I was 14. And I remember the, the joy and the kind of um, excitement that just came over me. And I remember like holding the magazine, like looking around, like, who can I tell? Like, who can I tell that I've discovered um, a name for this feeling? Um, and I sort of confessed to a, a male friend. And of course, immediately he said, oh, that's hot. Um, and I know I'm sure that other people have this sort of story as well. Um, that's the first sort of way of um, like a complex kind of dismissal, I guess, of the identity that but actually became a way that I could inhabit it. It's really complicated. Um, when I told other um, friends, it was, um, you know, a really a mix of reactions and and, you know, some of the journey of uh, internalized stigma and things like that started around that time. But 
I try to go back to that moment of just, yeah, seeing it represented um, through this awesome actress um, who I then became obsessed with. I had posters, I had a standee in my bedroom, everything like that. Um, I discovered the movie Gia, you know, where she's um, the bisexual model, Gia Marie Karanji. Um, and that was just a touchstone text for me. Um, but there weren't, you know, I, I don't think I even really sought out books because I just wasn't expecting to to find to find that it was it was through movies to begin with um, and then I discovered also uh, David Bowie and and through music and the the literary stuff came later yeah yeah um, I, I think that musicians probably were paving the way for people in my generation too at that time um, but I wonder whether um, the the lack of literary characters or literary um, figures uh, who declared their bisexuality was also because of the fact that we were reading children's books, which um, generally, uh, you know, they kind of don't talk about, didn't at the time when I was younger anyway, talk about sex so much. So actually identifying a character as bisexual would have been difficult. I wonder, Anna, if that's um, your experience as well, that you didn't come across many um, bisexual characters in the literature that you read. Absolutely did it. Yes, I even felt like my upbringing, especially the earliest years of my life, was so insulated. And apart from and growing up in Russia and reading a lot of Russian classic in school and university, that was the the only reading at the time that I did. And then getting a little bit into teenage, um, it was uh, supernatural things that I mostly was reading. And the only space that felt a little bit where at the time was watching Japanese animation Sailor Moon when I was still in high school and even earlier. And it was not explicitly queer, but it just felt like I was connecting with something there. And I still didn't have a word, still didn't know, uh, we didn't have a description for how I felt. And interestingly, on top of that, growing up in Russia and having such a strong bigotry uh, towards homosexuality specifically, I actually was very scared that I would be misunderstood or mistaken for a lesbian if I ever spoke about my feelings or any of the stories or experiences that I had. And it was, the fear was so intense as well. So all I could do is really just stay with it and keep it for myself and try to be as much as possible, um, as invisible as possible, really. And it is only so much late in my life when I came across books. And that was such a revelation for me because the word bisexual didn't come to me until my mid twenties. And then the, at the very beginning of my thirties, I find out that there is poetry, that there is fiction uh, and that there is nonfiction. And there's so many books that were actually talking to my experience and everything became so much lighter suddenly. But looking back, I felt like I was carrying this thing on my own and there was no representation at all. So it is fascinating to even have this conversation today. I'm going to come back to the idea of um, cultural um, references and bisexuality a little bit later. But um, I also wonder, what was it because um, homosexuality was illegal in Russia when you were growing up? Is that true? I think my understanding is that it was the conversations about it was illegal, representation of it was illegal, or talking, uh, so books, movies, uh, talking about it, or explicitly saying that you were homosexual is and was and still illegal because it has changed in 2013 yet, yet again. But growing up, I actually didn't even know. It was enough of having peers not accepting it so violently and so open that I never to look what the law would say. Mm. And it's really fascinating um, how those kind of different cultural settings can actually influence um, your relationship to your own sexuality. I will come back to that. But I just want to bring Emily in here because Emily, um, you are from a different generation to me, um, which uh, is interesting to me because um, relation, our relationship to um, sexuality has changed over the generations. In fact, we've probably got three different generations here in the room. And um, I think that that's interesting that um, your experience growing up might have been very, very different to mine and, and Anna's and Angela's. Um, 
was there representation of bisexuality or even homosexuality in literature when you were younger? I mean, I would love to say that there was, but honestly, there really was not, unfortunately. And as a result, I think around like the age 16, 17, I, I started to not really enjoy reading as much because I wasn't really seeing myself reflected and the way that I saw myself had changed, but these books were sort of staying the same, sort of almost stuck in the past. So I definitely gravitated a lot more to music. I'm so glad that um, Angela mentioned David Bowie because if not, I was going to. Um, yeah, a huge, huge David Bowie fan, still am. And yeah, I guess like a lot of a lot of other musicians, Lady Gaga as well. I always remember being like really, I remember going to one of her concerts and just being like so entertained and so sort of enthralled and like, just like the magic of it all and then not really finding out until like years later that she sort of identified as bisexual and feeling a bit betrayed by that feeling a bit upset that despite the fact that she's so well known that it's it's something that's almost i guess not intentionally hidden but just not thought about as just an afterthought and i think that's a common attitude that unfortunately still exists in a lot of um yeah cultural spheres um definitely a lot of movies and tv there I, i've seen increasing representation like there's the episode of black mirror san junipero which i still adore and like will rewatch and love it just as much as the first time that i watched it um but yeah other than that i really struggled to find anything that i felt represented me i know that there are a few sort of young the young adult sort of genre is getting a lot more diverse and the representation is getting a lot more meaningful and it's less trivialized but I think by the time that that had happened I wasn't feeling as connected to those books or I wasn't enjoying those books as much it had sort of grown up a bit or yeah grown past them I guess so unfortunately I would say things haven't improved too much in the sphere of literature but in other spheres it's nice to see a little bit more visibility and a little bit more representation that's actually meaningful and feels authentic yeah great I, I know that angela you're kind of um you said that you were dealing with this a little bit in the work that you are writing at the moment where you have two generations um of characters as the main characters in the book can you talk a little bit about that and how you're kind of looking at that generational change yeah, absolutely. Um, so Moon Sugar, my novel that comes out next year, has a 40 year old queer woman and a couple characters in their early 20s. And one of them is also bisexual. Um, and I, I'm 37. So um, I guess she's sort of close to my age, though, when I was writing it, I was a bit younger than her. Um, and I did want to um, explore through her that it had been a little bit more difficult for her to to own her sexuality um, and that she had sort of just uh, sort of folded into an easier sort of um, set of heteronormative, um, you know, um, aspects of, of life. And she just had this sort of desire that she just decided had to be dealt with um, internally. Uh, whereas the younger bisexual uh, male character um, he has grown up and actually my partner's younger than me and I've seen a lot of different things um, in that generation. Um, he's grown up with also a very accepting parents um, and uh, a lot more um, amongst his friends and at school, a lot more openness about queerness. I also made him grow up in Melbourne where she grew up um, in country Victoria. So I think there's, there can be a little bit of a difference in Australia as well, depending where you grow up. And um, I think when I moved to Melbourne, it was quite clear to me that um, in lots of ways, um, the experience can be really quite different if you, if you grow up in an Australian city compared to regionally or rurally um, in terms of sexuality, but many other factors as well. Um, so yeah, I kind of wanted to put some contrast in there and I did want to write a, a bisexual female character who um, who is, has moments of sort of reluctance who who thinks about it also in terms of what she was told when she was younger about feminism and that lo looking at other women with a, a lust desirous is, is also misogyny or she didn't she'd taken on a lot of different messages um 
and and you know i absolutely love all of the celebratory queer writing that's being done at the moment but i think i still um am wanting to explore i guess some of those um difficulties shame stigma you know and um there's a lot that's celebratory about it you know in the end actually um yeah i hope that sort of answers that yeah it sure does and i'm interested in that idea of the country um, versus the city in Australia and how um, our relationship to sexuality can be um, different depending on that community, that physical community that you grow up with, which is a kind of a less extreme version of your story, um, Anna, um, growing up in a completely different cultural background where the context has a whole lot of different, um, you know, uh, norms and symbols, language and um, ways of being queer in the world. I know from my own background, um, being growing up with my um, Slovenian grandmother, that there was absolutely no mention of um, homosexuality at all and no understanding of um, bisexuality or lesbian culture at all in my household. And I, I wonder when you found your sexuality, when was it that you could, was it actually physically moving to a different country that allowed you to open up to your own sexuality, Anna? Yes, I think finding that openness and awareness actually first came when I moved across to Australia and, and, and not straight away. I probably lived here for another decade before I claimed it, so to speak, for myself. And all my experiences, even back in Russia, where so they actually were very normal and natural to me because it was just Anna. The sexuality so didn't matter to me because there were so many other things I paid a lot more attention to and they, they mattered to me a lot more. And only in my observation of the treatment of homosexuality, I was trying to hide that as well. And that's where I felt really conflicted at the same time. So hiding a bad or dirty secret, it felt like. Uh, felt like that and it it is only after living uh, for about a decade in Australia where I started to finally feel very differently about it and not only say that bisexuality is my label today but I could say it out loud and I could actually embody it and I could actually feel it without feeling like oh hiding behind and saying oh I'm bisexual or being a bit unsure it just had so much strength and, and power after many safe experiences over time. But I think it still took such a long time because moving from Russia to Australia, I still tried to find connections that were familiar to my past experiences. And I would still connect with um, many bigoted Australians who were say voting no during the plebiscite for the gay marriage. And I was still surrounded a lot by what I knew. It was easier. Uh, the big jump was too scary at the time and bisexuality was entirely invisible and it's just the introduction through through gay culture and through finally meeting gay people and making even friends with them i could sort of dip my toe in and feel safe and finally claim the label for myself and you've written about this you've actually written um about your sexuality um and i wonder whether you were worried that um, people from your family, um, people who are Russian and friends of yours would um, read this and how that would um, affect your relationship with your Russian family and friends. Yes, this is still uh, something that I am worried about in a way of feeling that in my body, even though with my brain, with all my work around accepting self and loving self, I've come to finally feeling like this is the time to potentially have a session. At the time, I'm also letting it just go. And I'm thinking that it will eventually, the book will eventually write to some of my family members. It has not yet, and some of my friends uh, from a past did see the book and some of them even read it. And some of them did tell me that this is way too personal. We don't share things like this. And it's a bit unusual and weird. But I did not have any other any other circumstances of feeling very uncomfortable. So it's like another step of training myself to about who I am 
regardless of the culture I came from and to have another confirmation that this is possible, even though it is rather terrifying. And also telling the story in the book was so helpful, even though I must have said, I, I must have said I was terrified so many times and thankfully my publisher was just really supportive in that process. But as I told the stories, I sort of put them to rest. And I decided to claim it out loud in the form that I don't have to constantly tell myself it was sort of there and the introduction could happen in the world. And that made me feel a little bit more freer and lighter, I think. But the, the fear with the family and with especially my more extended family is still definitely there and this is to be continued. Yep. So, uh, Emily, I'd like to turn to you now. Um, how has your um, bisexuality impacted your writing work? Um, I guess it's a work in progress. I feel sometimes I, I have these sort of lofty like ambitions of like, I'm going to include this and this and this in my writing. But when I get down to it, I just it feels very forced and very contrived and I sort of feel mad like I should be the person that should be able to write about this and do it well but I can't but I think what I've come to realize is that yeah I guess I've just come to realize that you know I've got to approach it how I sort of approach it in my real life like I'm not I guess I'm not trying to like force it out and I'm not trying to you know force it into parts of my life where it doesn't really belong like I'm just existing and I'm just trying to enjoy things as they come and so I think I try and do that with my characters as well um the book that things that have been like published are sort of I guess fit more under like just the queer umbrella it's a little bit more of a universal experience rather than something specific to bisexuality however I'm trying to sort of inch a bit close closer and I think that kind of comes down to just getting to know myself a bit better I think yeah and getting more comfortable with myself and as I get more comfortable with myself and who I am I think that's sort of coming across in my writing and it's feeling a little bit more authentic and I'm prouder of these characters that I'm creating and that they're actually proud of themselves and they don't have a shame within themselves as well so I think it's something that I do try and include as much as I can. Sometimes it does scare me and that surprises me, but I think I've just, I'm learning to just sort of go with those feelings and address those feelings rather than push them away, keep working at it. And, you know, accepting that like, like my characters are going to be flawed just like I am. And they, no one's ever going to be the perfect bisexual that doesn't exist. Like it's never going to exist. So yeah, just accepting that you know, they're going to, these characters are going to make mistakes. These characters are going to do things that maybe things that I don't even expect, but that that's all part of writing, no matter who you're writing about. Fantastic. It's a, sometimes I think that it's a, a constant coming out um, in for your characters as well, because, um, you know, for me, I know that my, in, in my personal life, it's a constant coming time I meet a new group of people. I have to go, oh, by the way, I am bisexual because otherwise they would not know um and i feel like sometimes there's that that awkward step in the books that i'm writing where i have to kind of somehow tell the audience so if i have a character in one of my books who's married to a person of the opposite gender um and you know it's like how do i explain to the the readers that this person is not this person is bisexual I wonder if um, you've had this experience too Angela yeah definitely um, I think it it's so interesting I was thinking about when there was the um, announcement um, you know Superman and son um, be bisexual in the comics um, comes out as bisexual and that all the images were of him kissing a, a, a boy and I'm like it's like the visual representation of bisexuality is still a, a homosexuality and um or, or an act of yeah you know what i mean um and yeah it's really tricky um when you're writing a, a bisexual character because it is very similar to like in real life whether you go do i do i mention a past a past lover you know is is that the little hint that i give or do i you know show them being attracted to someone 
um, you know, that's going to give the hint or, you know, as I know I might do in a social situation, like, you know, that person is attractive. <laughs> I don't know, something that's like signifies, um, you know, my sexuality. Um, so yeah, I guess it is. It's all the same sort of things that come across uh, with a bisexual character. Um, yeah. And Anna, have you had this experience? Because you've written nonfiction predominantly, but you're thinking about writing fiction. Is that correct? I am. How are you going to deal with it? I'm thinking about it. That is such a good question. That's what I've been thinking about so much as well. And I've noticed that I am very often very direct, and my coming out happens almost every day. In conversation, I just somehow slide it in. And so I have a suspicion that once I'm putting this story together, it will be quite direct or in a humorous conversation between people or almost like an introduction when you have a little badge on your on your chest and it says, my name is, you may say bisexual. I'm feeling like it might be a bit, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Something that is coming with fireworks like, and there's a word bisexual um, instead of trying to give hints. But this is something that I'm about to figure out. Mm. It's, I suppose it's different when you're writing a book which um, focuses on sexuality and sex is a big part of the book and you can show scenes of, of you know, sex, but not everybody is comfortable writing sex and not every book needs sex scenes in it. Are there other ways, um, are there kind of hints or clues apart from just having a bad saying I'm bisexual, which is a great way of doing it. I think I might just get one made up. Um, but is there, are there other sort of um, hints or clues or, or subtle ways? I wonder, um, Emily, if you have any ideas? Um, yeah, I guess it just, I think it's definitely easier if you as a writer can relate to that experience as being bisexual. Cause yes, unfortunately I don't have, I can't carry fireworks around, although I'd love to. Um, yeah, I think Often a lot of visual cues, like a lot of people wear pins, colors, certain makeup. Like I've seen certain TikTok trends where there's like someone who would do like an eyeshadow look for all the pride colors and it looks really great. And for somebody that might be their way of like indicating to people. But of course it also depends on the people you're around. So like if you're in a group of other people who are like queer identifying, they will probably pick up on that visual like cue but if you're not, it, it's probably not going to translate. So I think it really depends on the character themselves, whether they're, they've embraced themselves yet, whether they haven't, what, whether they're quite an outgoing and outspoken person or whether they're not. And then it also depends on the audience, whether, you know, do they have a lot of queer friends and, you know, who understand these sort of visual cues or, you know, social cues, or are they, you know, in an isolated area where they're sort of, they feel like they're the only one that's going through this. And I think in that case, a more sort of direct conversation, a, link, a very direct conversation is required. Otherwise, it's just so easily brushed under the rug by these really strict binaries that we experience. So yeah, I think you definitely have to consider one, your character and two, the audience and what kind of um, context the audience is coming from. All those, you know, the other characters around, yeah. I suppose there's a difference between um, also whether you're writing your work for um, a queer press or whether you're writing it for a mainstream audience. And Angela, you've had a lot of experience in publishing. Um, do you, like, I, I've actually been asked by other authors, how do you feel about publishing your work um, through a queer press? People actually ask those questions, um, you know, in green room conversations. How um, do you feel, is there a difference between um, how you express yourself in the queer press to mainstream publishing? Yeah, I think um, it's a really interesting conversation because I think, you know, there can be queer writing for other people who are queer and who, you know, are your community and that is really awesome and really beautiful. Um, or you might be writing something, um, a genre novel or something that, that generally you're happy for the audience to be absolutely anybody. Um, and, you know, it just happens to have queer characters because queer people exist in real life and, you know, do all, all of the things that other people do and can be superheroes and can be everything. 
Um, but I think it would be a different experience, you know, with a with a small queer press or with like a mainstream publisher. I think possibly the editing experience could be a little different. Um, so when I uh, worked at Echo Publishing, I did publish um, some queer writers. I published um, Alison Evans, who's a trans writer, and Alison had a character, well, in other books, multiple characters um, who were trans and non-binary and, you know, characters who use the they pronoun. And, you know, I tried my best, of course, to make that a, um, a safe experience. And um, it was actually a really wonderful opportunity to be able to talk to booksellers and people um, about um, queer and gender queer um, and, you know, about the language around it. And um, yeah, so that, I mean, Echo is a, definitely a, a more a mainstream um, commercial publisher. Um, so I don't know, there's a lot of layers to it. Um, um, there's a lot of different experiences authors can have. I think if you're an author and you're um, putting forward a book um, with queer characters to be published, um, you know, make sure you've got that support around you. There could be amazing things about the process and there could be difficult things as well, like being having to talk in front of different groups of people or in meetings and people basically asking you to come out and justify your sexuality or your gender or, you know, there can be some really um, confronting things around it. Um, but, you know, it can also be absolutely wonderful. I know um, some of the authors I work with and other queer authors I know who now get to speak to students or give workshops um, and things like that, which they find really rewarding and amazing and publishing a book kind of meant that they then were able to do that. Um, yeah. I wonder, um, Anna, have you had um, thoughts about whether you'd be more comfortable um, publishing into queer spaces or into um, mainstream spaces? I was really lucky to publish my first book with a queer publisher and I found that very uh, nurturing and editing process was actually very specific as well. I think we were able to just pay attention to a lot of other areas and um, we, we were able to explain the words we've been used and put a lot more information uh, and further reading that just more supportive. And I just love that experience. I love that we could have a lot more support in that space. And I think there is, I just felt like there was so much more understanding for the reader as well as myself. My experience was really good with, with a queer publisher, with this specific queer publisher as well. But also I felt that it would be a much softer experience for, for readers. And I thought the book would be feeling heavy enough in the stories within it that that's another layer of understanding from a queer publisher to help me structure things so they are flowing lighter and that we have trigger warnings and we have further reading and further information. I thought that was fantastic. And, and that is a big benefit, I think, for publishing for queer space and from the queer space and with queer space. But at the same time, um, I remember talking with my publisher and they mentioned what was my dream media or, or where would I love to have a conversation the most? And I said, the most mainstream place possible. I would love to go to the places where people would probably hear it for the first time and have a little bit of a teaser, a little bit of conversation in a space where it wasn't possible before because that invisibility for others could be very real right now. And yet accidentally almost, they could have come across this conversation and I would love that. And I, that's why I hope that um, all other spaces and the mainstream publishing, I would love for them to notice more and pick up more of that. And maybe that would be a little bit more challenging conversation to publish with them, but I would just love them to open that, that door and to have it in more spaces, and especially in the spaces where it's not expected to be. Mm. I think that we, we don't necessarily talk about bisexuality so much in those mainstream spaces. And I think that we probably need more representation in the mainstream. Um, and I know that, you know, my publisher is a mainstream publisher, so I'm very grateful to them for allowing those conversations to happen in my books. But not all publishers 
um, are as uh, nice, I suppose. And um, they're probably also driven by um, audiences who are expecting uh, to see themselves. And if you've got more um, straight um, readers of a particular brand, um, then they're probably going to put more straight stuff out in the world. How, how do you feel about that, Emily? Yeah, definitely. I think that, um, yeah, I mean, people do, especially with literature, it is very personal and they like to see themselves represented. Um, and so that is definitely a challenge that you would come across. I know with my anthology, it was all queer writers and all queer stories. So the editing process and all of that was very, very like, yeah, I always felt at ease. I never felt pressured to share anything I didn't want to share or cut anything that, you know, was personal to me. And there was, yeah, it was always room for a sort of an open discussion and a non-judgmental discussion, which I really appreciated. And yeah, my publisher doesn't just specialize with queer text. There's like very, they publish a huge sort of diversity of work. They publish audio things, they publish memoirs, they publish fiction, they publish nonfiction. So that was, yeah, I was very impressed by that. I think what made the experience so good is that the people, I guess, behind the scenes were queer, or at least they were like strong enough allies that they were well informed about things like that. I guess the risk with the, yeah, with a mainstream publisher is that you don't have those people sort of behind the scenes that are there to support you. Whereas like, you know, the readers may be supportive, but the readers see that final product. They don't see all of the things that sort of go on behind the scenes. So yeah, I guess it's just, um, yeah, I, I guess I understand that people do want to see, you know, they want to see themselves, but I think people are also willing to be challenged if they feel like it's a safe environment. They're willing to go slightly out of their comfort zone if they feel like, yeah, the story isn't going to attack anybody in some way or isn't going to be, I guess, too transgressive. So even though it is frustrating, I guess it's that idea of, you know, baby steps. Like I, in like young adult novels, we're seeing, you know, like coming out stories and things like that. Hopefully in the next few years, we'll, we'll go beyond that. We'll go on to, you know, what happens after that? what happens then um so i think it's just baby steps it's just testing the waters for the sake i guess of your mental health as the writer and you know the experience of the readers and building that trust takes time and you know takes a while so just having the, and patience, the future guess, might be, to stick it out the future might be a little bit um more open to um different voices as um you know i have every faith in younger generations actually i think that um they're taking things um way more quickly um in a great direction so i love the kids my, my money's on the kids um angela you've mentioned before and and um we've had these conversations about um about uh genre and how genre even um you know even in my day back in the day genre embraced um queerness uh, a lot more readily than um, mainstream literary fiction did at the time. Um, I wonder if you can um, elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, sure. So I think, um, again, you know, we've been talking about Australian publishing a little bit. I think it is a little bit behind still on this. Um, and we don't have um, many mainstream genre publishers or imprints in Australia anymore. But we do have four small presses that um, queer genre stuff, um, clandestine press comes to mind. They, they do tons of crime, fantasy, science fiction. Um, um, oh God, I'm blanking on the other ones, but overseas, um, uh, what Emily was talking about, you know, how we're starting to move from the sort of just the coming out stories, which are very important, but to sort of a broader range of representation of queer characters. Um, science fiction and fantasy um, overseas um, the, and romance, sorry. Um, even just in the last like two to three years, I would say, there is suddenly um, a lot more happening and it's really exciting and really fun and cool. Um, Casey McQuiston is one author who, um, uh, her, I think I think I pronounced her, um, 
a couple of books um, have just been um, really, really popular. And so then, you know, for mainstream publishers, that's what they look at. They're going to make money. And so then they've gone, OK, we need more queer texts. We need more bisexual texts. And um, so then there's been a lot more sort of fun romance novels with queer characters. Um, I saw someone on Twitter the other day post a list of sapphic books. Um, I don't know, some of them were, were simply like a lesbian characters, some of them might have been bisexual characters, but it went on and on and on and they were all ones coming out um, this year. So um, I think, again, they were all American publishers. Um, but yeah, it's really exciting to see. I think that um, those genres are kind of paving the way. Um, literary fiction maybe um, is, is catching up and there's obviously some really great um, literary examples as well. Um, I've got a little, my little book list ready for when we get to that. But yeah, um, go genre fiction. Absolutely. Do you is that something that you read, um, Anna? Are you, do you read genre fiction? I mean, definitely. Um, you know, Ursula Le Guin and um, even Marian Zimmer Bradley. When I was younger, was um, the Catch Trap was one of the first books that I read with a, a bisexual character in it. Um, I have you have you engaged with genre or would you be sticking to literary fiction if you were writing your fiction your next fiction book that's such a good question i'm still deeper even into reading fiction i think i've done so much of it during my first education back in russia and then as soon as i moved out of the country i have not touched any fiction for so long and when I first even bumped into books about bisexuality, they were mostly memoirs or coming out stories uh, or more almost academic pieces that were around sexuality and specifically bisexuality. So that space is really interesting and I have not looked into it enough at, at this moment. And I'm really curious also because of, because of my background <clears throat> where people are set in a certain political situation as well, in a certain political and cultural space. I'm curious how could that also look in fiction? And I think that's the space I'm also interested to try and show um, because I feel when I look at Russia and look at Australia, I feel such big difference just in how people can walk along the streets and how they feel because of the, the, the governmental situation and their political situation and how different it is reflected in people just because of the culture or the government. And what would be the feel like in the air for bisexuality for a specific country if, if that was set in the fiction. Um, and the story that I want to start writing is about going back to a country where there is fear in the air, but then at the same time, how do you hold yourself even in a space like that. And, and that's where I also was thinking about um, instead of giving hints from characters, is it possible to give hints from the environment of the space? Um, and unfortunately, have not read enough of fiction, uh, bisexual fiction right now. And, and that would be one of my places to look at as well. Great. Lots of things in your future, I think. Um, I, I'm interested in, in how nonfiction um, and not just, we've all written nonfiction essays um, which talk about our sexuality very explicitly, I think. Um, but um, I wonder, you know, big nonfiction books about particular subjects, um, whether the sexuality of the author would actually um, influence how those books were written and um, what is looked at. So, for instance, I'm, I'm a massive fan of mushrooms. Um, and mushrooms have all kind of sexualities. And um, it would be really interesting to see books about mushrooms written by queer people specifically, um, because that would bring another layer to um, those non-fictional subjects. I wonder whether you guys think that um, the sexuality of the author would have a big impact on how um, that subject would play out. Angela, I might start with you. I, I love this question, Chrissy, and I think um, you and I also share an interest in, in space and physics and things like that. And I, I guess anything that feels sort of expansive to me does seem to have something to do with my sexuality and my personality, which I see as kind of intertwined. Um, I'm also 
a, a burgeoning, I guess, um, environmental activist, and I'm trying to do a lot more in that space. And I think about a lot about the sort of interconnectedness of people and the environment. And um, I guess, again, this gathering of things together rather than splitting binaries, you know, um, it, it, it seems relevant also to the subject. And um, so, yeah, I do think it's true that um, there's there can be a sort of bisexual way of thinking or, I mean, obviously we're all extremely different, but yeah, there might be a sort of expansiveness. I'm very interested in, in this idea and maybe queerness in, in general as well. How about you, Emily? How do you feel about that, that um, the, the sexuality of the author would influence um, the book despite the subject of the book? Um, yeah, I think it definitely does have an influence. Like there's a lot of, I guess like children's books. I've completely forgotten the name, but there's the one of like the two frogs. And it turns out the person that wrote it, he like was, he was gay, I believe, but yeah. And a lot of queer people saying, I felt so connected to that book like as a child, but couldn't really say why. I think there's that nice sort of subconscious like communication or those subconscious signals that we kind of get that sort of increase that sense of unity, which is super important because a lot of yeah, queer kids don't have those role models or don't have those friendships maybe in their real life. So literature is a really nice place to escape and to find those, to find those friends, you know, friends in those characters and friends in those writers even. Um, yeah, I think anything, yeah, expansive, that's a really good point. That definitely feels like something that would definitely be tackled differently by a queer writer. I also feel like anything that sort of exists in a gray area, anything that's sort of not so clearly cut, clearly cut, sorry, like black and white, is just dealt really well with by a bi plus author or a queer author or somebody whose gender identity exists between the binary, the male female binary. Um, yeah, I think there's just so many topics that even if we don't know at the time, you know, much about the author or if it's found out posthumously, we still seem to sort of understand that connection. There's sort of something subconscious going on there, which I think just adds another layer of enjoyment to those texts. So yeah, I definitely do think it makes a difference. You remind me um, of Tov Janssen, who was one of um, the, um, you know, seminal authors of my childhood. And I didn't know that she was a lesbian. Um, but her books seem to speak directly to me and the characters seem to speak directly to me um, as a queer youngster. So yeah, I think you're right that that kind of subliminal um, queerness is coming across and, and um, you're feeling that connection regardless. Now, um, I'd like to ask you all about, um, about books that you might recommend people and they might be fictional books or they might be non-fiction books, but if you think that there are any if there are any authors out there, bis bisexual authors out there who are wanting to kind of read um, books that reflect them in the world. Like I know that I recently um, read um, the book, uh, Paul Takes the Form of a Mortal Girl. I don't know if anybody has read that, um, but it's an incredibly um, sexy uh, book with lots of sex in it and lots of, you know, lots of gender swapping and lots of really interesting sexuality. Um, and recently I've, I've been reading um, a lot of trans memoirs actually. Um, and I've read all about Eve by Eve Rees and Kaya Wilson's As Beautiful As Any Other. And I feel like um, trans memoirs are speaking to me as a bisexual person because the, binar the gender binary is something that um, doesn't really feature in my desires at all. Um, and so I'm, I'm kind of learning a lot from those memoirs. I was wondering um, if you all um, could perhaps um, suggest books that people might be um, interested in discovering. I don't know, Anna, you said you haven't read much fiction, but are there, there any books that you would recommend to people? There's actually two books that I'm really enjoying at the moment. And one of them is an anthology of stories, which was published in the UK. And unfortunately not wildly available. It's something you have to discover. And I sort of discovered it. And it is called Bible as by E. And there are two books of them, and they're all stories of, of very diverse humans. So it was fascinating to read how different the experiences were. And the second book that I'm really enjoying still, and I think I'm 
going second time through it now because it's just so beautiful. But I'm reading love letters between Virginia Woolf and uh, Vita Sackle West, who were uh, both authors and both bi bisexual women, and just letters between the two and, and how they talk about love and how they talk about connection. And, and because bisexuality is often so much intertwined with sex, but there's other avenues of being bisexual. It doesn't always have to feature sex. I feel like that is such an interesting space because they are sharing with each other how they feel, they share gossip, they, they share friendship. And it is so beautiful and so sexy to read as well. Thank you, Anna. And Angela, what would you suggest to people? I'm glad that Virginia and Vita came up. Um, <laughs> um, so I've got a little list here. Um, I'm going to, I'll mostly recommend Australian authors because that's what I do. Um, I mentioned Alison Evans. Um, Alison is a trans writer. Um, I, Ida, Highway Bodies and Euphoria Kids. Um, they're all genre YA novels. They're really, really fun. Um, Marley Jane Ward's Orphan Corp series. Um, Ellen Van Nierven's Heat and Light, and there are other books too. Um, Christopher Ruz is a, a fantasy, sci-fi and horror author. Um, Margaret Morgan, who wrote The Second Cure, um, that's just an excellent science fiction novel. Um, Laura McPhee Brown's Cherry Beach, that's a literary fiction sort of coming of age. Um, Vaughan, excellent short story writer. Um, lush queer stories um, in some game books where you become the protagonist, which I think is really fun. And I absolutely love, love um, Melissa Lukashenko's Too Much Lip. Um, that character identifies as a lesbian, but there is there's great complexity there. Um, so those are my Australian um, queer author recommendations. Gosh, that's a fantastic list, Angela. Thank you very much for writing that one down. Um, and um, last but not least, Emily, what have you um, got to recommend? I don't have too many, but I'm so happy that everyone else has had very extensive lists because I'll definitely be looking into all of those. Um, I mean, I think people love to hate on YA, but I don't mind it too much. There's um, a book called Leah on the Offbeat, which is... Uh, I guess you could call sequel to Love, Simon, which they then made into the movie a few years ago. I just think that universe is really nice. I think that, you know, these often, I think with some of the, I mean, it comes across particularly in movies, I guess, but when it's people much older than um, the people that they're playing, it can feel a little bit stunted, but I just think she captures that sort of young adult voice really, really well. And that's a really nice one. Um, another one which is a little bit, I guess, left of field is uh, Claudine Alaco, which is by Colette, who they made the movie about a few years ago with Kira Knightley. So I don't think in the book it's more, it's more sort of homoerotic and like very salacious and she goes to a private school and she's, you know, horribly behaved and it's all very, it was all like really super scandalous at the time. But it's just so exciting to read things by writers who are like just so themselves unapologetically themselves and I think that sort of translates even though the story itself isn't necessarily specifically or explicitly bisexual I think the fact that she wrote such a book in such a time and it's just she's just so unapologetically herself and so is that character I think bisexual readers and writers will have a lot to learn from that. I do love the Colette books, actually. I think that they're um, fantastic and a great place to start if you haven't read any books by bi bisexual authors, actually. Um, that's been absolutely fantastic to hear your recommendations. I thought that it, just in our last minute that we have left, um, I would like to just ask you each very quickly, um, in the, your utopian future, how would you like to see bisexuality represented in literature? Um, very quickly. So. Um, Angela, you got any ideas? Um, being put on the spot. Um, I guess I would just love to see more of it. Yeah, um, more bisexual characters um, having a good time being bisexual. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks. That's good. Excellent. <laughs> Anna, what about you? What do you think? I just wanted to become the least interesting thing about someone at all. There's so many other interesting parts of humans and then I would love sexuality to entirely drop off and just be 
not very interesting and nobody would kind of almost notice it without, of course, feeling invisible. And how about you, Emily? I think, um, yeah, seeing, I guess, like relationships and bisexual people that exist outside of the gender binary, I think we're seeing some really good representation of bisexual women, perhaps a little less so of bisexual men, but I feel like we see almost nothing when it comes to non-binary gender fluid or people that exist outside of the gender binary in terms of their bisexuality. So uh, it would be great to see a little bit more of that and yeah, representation that exists beyond binary, seeing as that is kind of the whole point of bisexuality itself. Great. I couldn't agree more. I think it has been fantastic to have the representation of three amazing bisexual authors here today. And I look forward to um, the three of us leading or the four of us leading the charge um, to change the face of um, literature in the future. So go forth, be bisexual, have a lot of fantastic, great queer sex. Um, on the page and in real life. Thank you very, very much for joining me today. Emily, Anna and Angela, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.